Good morning and welcome and I'm delighted today to introduce you to Professor Anne Johnson who's the Director of the Division of Population Health here at University College. Anne, thank you very much for your time today. And I'd like to start by taking you back to ask you to think and tell us about what made you decide on a career in medicine? Well, that's a long time ago um, and I was doing sciences at school. I came from a medical family and I have to admit it wasn't really a positive choice. I think I um, fell into medicine rather than chose it. Um, and when I went to study medicine, um, I was actually much more interested in the way society contributed to people's health and ill health, I think, than I was in some of the great the details of physiology and anatomy. It turned out that's exactly the way my career has evolved. So that was interesting. So it seems that right from the start of your medical training as an undergraduate, you started to become attracted to that big picture in population health. I did my undergraduate training in Cambridge, which was a wonderful experience because I was able to interact with people across a range of disciplines, something which we've been doing at UCL, which I really enjoy. And um, I was in the third year able to do what would be the equivalent of an intercalated BSc now at UCL, then a BA, and I studied social and political sciences. So how did you find out about a career in public health? It wasn't really until after I completed my general practice training that I think I became fully aware of what the opportunities were and it wasn't really until I actually became a trainee that I was able to look at the academic options which is where I realised I wanted to go. And could you tell us a little bit about your career pathway, how you got from there to here? Having had an interest throughout the training period in going into community medicine I then applied for the London scheme which enabled you to go and do an MSc at the School of Hygiene. And quite by chance, on a management training programme, at a time when I was looking for an academic post, um, I met a, a lecturer who was working in the Department of Genital Urinary Medicine at the middle, what was then the Middlesex Hospital Medical School. And he said, oh, my boss, Mike Ardler, is looking for somebody who wants to do something on the epidemiology of sexually transmitted infections and HIV. And um, it turned out they'd advertised the post and no one had applied. So I went to, went to see Mike Ardler and I can very well remember um, meeting him and discussing this post which was a joint post in public health between um, an academic post at the Middlesex with what was then Bloomsbury Health Authority. And of course it was incredibly interesting, it was the very early days of HIV and I do remember practically uh, skipping all the way home recognising that this, was a, this would be a great job for me, which I then got, with the idea I'd stop in it for two, for two years. Anyway, it's now 25 years later and I'm not quite in the same job but I've you know, cl um, gradually uh, you know, progressed along the academic track um, since then. And of course there was this incidence with the conflict with Margaret Thatcher. It was a very, um, oh, it was a fascinating time to be involved in the HIV epidemic and nobody knew how much the epidemic would spread. And so we got into studying transmission of HIV and that was all about sexual behaviour. That was an area that nobody um, took seriously as, a, as, a, as an area for scientific inquiry. There were lots of magazine surveys, but no one really understood what proportion of the population were at risk of HIV. And then it was, we waited and waited and waited to see if the, if the government would fund it, until one day when a journalist rang us up and said that he had had the word that, that, that the um, survey had been banned by the then Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. And uh, yeah, so we were front page news on the Sunday Times one Sunday morning. So what would you say were the biggest challenges that you've faced in your career up to now and even today? I mean, I think one of the biggest challenges is deciding where to put your energies. And that balance within work is one thing, but then you've also got to have a life outside of work. And that's, of course, something which is as important for men as it is for women. So I sense that you don't feel that the work-life balance issue is in effect a women's issue. I mean I think this is the next stage in our thinking about this that actually the whole way that we 
operate has to be as much for men as it is for women. I mean, men, women may feel pressurised because they feel the burden is on them or the pressure is on them to manage home and work. But then equally, the men have the pressure to meet this 24-7 lifestyle. And I, we've got to come to some balance. Otherwise, for every meeting that is called at UCL at 5 o'clock in the evening, essentially, in some ways, excludes those people who need to get home and cook the dinner. Yes, and of course, there's always this question about how it is ever possible to maintain a very good work-life balance when the career is so demanding. Um, well, I mean, I think the reality, of course, is this, you know, it's hugely exciting being involved in a lot of these things. I mean, to be involved in um, the work I've done for Medical Research Council, Wellcome Trust, that, that it, it's really interesting to be involved in, um, you know, shaping where priorities are in research and evaluating research and trying to also develop other people's careers. I think that's a really wonderful thing to do. So it's a really interesting job. But of course, it's, and it's a huge part of one's life. But then a huge part of my life is also, like everybody's, is what goes on outside your life, which is your, your family or your interests outside of work. And, and trying to keep that in balance is, I think, quite demanding. Um, I have two, I had my children quite late in life. Um, and they're now, in, they're now teenagers. So I had the advantage of having done a lot of the basic training, having my MD, having a secure um, grants and so on. I mean, I can very well remember putting in my application for readership while feeding my six-week-old baby um, and trying to get all the paperwork in while on maternity leave. And then for my next baby, I was putting in the application to be a professor. And I remember reading proofs for our first book on maternity leave and so on. The most important thing for me, I think, at home is, is the, well, a supportive environment because I think this is as much for men as it is for women and so that's been very important that I think my husband's been really um, supportive in sharing a lot of that work. And now, what sort of things are you doing now that really interest you and keep you inspired and in moving forward? <laughs> Plans for the future. Well, I suppose now, um, you know, there comes a point when you have to decide, do you go, I mean, you know, traditionally you stay in a head of department job for five years. I'm now past my sell-by date. Um, I've done seven. And uh, so you either go up, up a, an, another managerial rat, rung, or I think you then say, no, I'm going to go back to my research and to things outside, outside of UCL. So I, I think the main thing about my career, it's changed all the time. Of course, the other thing that happens out, outside of in medicine once you have a leadership role is that you will get drawn into advising government or government committees in various ways. So I've sat on a number of DH um, uh, advisory groups at various times. And most recently I've joined the um, climate, uh, the, um, the subcommittee on climate change adaptation for DEFRA, which is a, a whole new role in a whole new world, which I think will be will be very interesting but you know it brings new learning and new responsibilities. Anne that's been most interesting thank you very much for your time today. You're welcome thank you for asking me.